Well, good morning, church. Uh, as I said earlier, my name is Ben Voss. I'm the director of youth ministry over at the Orange City campus, and it's my pleasure uh, to join you in worship today to bring a message from God's Word. Uh, if you've been tracking with us, we're almost done in our series on joy from the book of Philippians. Uh, today we're going to tackle the first nine verses in the fourth chapter of that book. Uh, and if you haven't been with us or you've been gone for a little while, uh, we've been focusing on this topic of joy in a letter that Paul wrote to the Philippians 2,000 years ago. We've come to the text each week, and, and we've found joy in all kinds of things. It, it's a theme of the book. We found joy in hardships, joy in pain and loss, joy in waiting and being patient, joy in serving and in working out your faith. Uh, we've even found joy in sharing in Christ's suffering, right? That was, that was chapter 3. I think that's such a countercultural thing, especially in 21st century America, uh, to, to take joy in suffering, to, to be identified with Christ in his suffering, and then to take joy in that. It's pretty easy to read a book like this and, and wring out every last drop of joy because it's all over the place. And so that's what we're going to do again here today. Uh, we'll return to the text and we'll find Paul's final encouragement to rejoice and to pray always. Now, before we get there, the temptation, I think, the temptation, uh, when we read a book like Philippians, is to come to the text and assume that the Christian faith is easy. To assume that the Christian faith, if you're a Christian, everything's going to be better, like it's going to be roses and daisies and peaches and cream and pie in the sky and everything's beautiful and wonderful and is anybody hungry yet? Because it's all just nice stuff, right? Like it's, it's easy for folks inside the church and outside the church to assume that life is easy when you follow Jesus, that we'll be blessed, that, that we won't experience hardship, that God always provides for us, and he gives us what we ask for, and so on. And those things may be true, but if you've lived for more than a couple years on this earth, um, then you realize that life isn't easy, that things don't always go your way, that God doesn't spare his children pain or loss or divisions or hard things. Being a Christian, some might say, is even more difficult, is even more anxiety-producing, even more um, depressing than not being a Christian, right? When, especially if you think about certain places in our country or certain parts of the world that we live in, right? Being a Christian, it's as if you have a big target on your back. That When you say yes to Jesus, when you sign up to follow him and be his disciple, now people are coming for you. It's harder to be a Christian, you could say. And all you would have to do is look at some of the research behind anxiety and depression and self-harm and suicide and the prescription meds that are, are given for all of these issues in our country alone to realize that life isn't easy. Life is hard. Christian or not, we worry. We're anxious. Our minds don't stop. We keep trying to pull from tomorrow the anxiety that exists in the future and bring it into the present with us, right? Like Jesus talked about this in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. He says, he says don't worry about tomorrow. He says, it's about little things like food and clothing, right? Let, let them take care of themselves tomorrow. You focus on today. That's the encouragement of Jesus and we'll find similar encouragement from Paul here at the end of Philippians. Today, we have to look at what it means to rejoice always, to pray about everything in the midst of anxiety, in the midst of worry, in the midst of fear. So if you brought your Bible, or I guess you maybe didn't bring your Bible, hopefully you have a Bible at your house somewhere, uh, I invite you to find that Bible, dust it off a little bit, and turn to the book of Philippians. Those of you who are here, I'd like you to turn to Philippians 2. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, you should be able to see the words on the screens behind me. We're going to read verses 1 through 9 of chapter 4 in Philippians. And it goes like this. 
Therefore, my brothers, or brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, says Paul, practice these things, and the God of peace will will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, as, as I see it, as I wrestled with the text in the last couple of weeks, these verses can be broken down into three distinct sections. The first section is verse one. It, it really should be a part of chapter three. We just decided to divide it up a little differently when we translate it into English. But verse one of chapter four is the finishing of the end of chapter 3, right? Whenever you see a therefore in the text, you should circle back to the previous paragraph or the previous chapter and try to discover what the author is trying to connect, right? There There are two things that the author wants to connect. Whenever you see a therefore, you need to figure out why it's there for, right? I know that's bad English, but helps me remember. So verse 1 says, therefore, And it links the readers back to the idea that our citizenship is in heaven, right? That's the end of chapter 3, that that, uh, Paul wants the Philippians to stand firm in the fact that we don't belong to this world, that we were made for a different world, that, that our final resting place will be with God in heaven for all of eternity, that what's happening right now is not the end of the story. So he says, stand firm firm that our bodies will be glorified just like jesus body was glorified right that that this is what we have faith in this is what we hope for that one day we'll see jesus for who he really is and when we see him we'll be made like him in his glory right that's that's what our liturgy says whenever we come to the table and celebrate communion that one day with unveiled face, we eat this meal in hope And the hope is that we will see Jesus for who he really is. And then we'll be made like him in his glory. So Paul Paul is just circling back and saying, that's what you should stand firm in. That's what you need to bank on. Is that one day we'll see Jesus. That our citizenship is in heaven. The second section of these verses is verse 2 and verse 3. Look back at the text with me for a moment. There are two ladies in the Philippian church who are at odds with each other. Now, we don't know the nature of their disagreement. The text really doesn't give us any clues. We don't know much about the context of their disagreement or their argument, right? If this has been going on for months or if this was just a recent thing, um, we do know that Paul thinks very highly of these ladies, right? He sees their discouragement as a smudge on the sterling reputation of the Philippian church, right? Euodia and Syntyche have worked so hard for the gospel. That's what Paul says, right? It would be a shame for their work to be in vain simply because they can't get along in this present moment. And so Paul encourages them to mend fences, to to figure out how to get along. He even asks another church member to come and help them reconcile for the sake of their church and for the sake of the gospel of Christ. And so now we move to the third section 
of Philippians 4, verses 1 through 9. It's the last five verses. This is a much more popular part of chapter 4, the part that many of you guys are sure, I'm sure, are familiar with. Uh, There's even a a hymn with the words from verse 4 in it, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Maybe you guys are familiar with that. That comes from verse 4 of chapter 4, right? So uh, Paul has finished his thoughts on chapter 3. He's addressed the issue, the spat between those two ladies, uh, the two church members, and now his attention turns to closing the letter. He tells us to rejoice twice. Now, I wonder why his command to rejoice is so emphatic. I wonder what Paul is getting at When he instructs us to rejoice always, after all the language in the Greek here, this is in the imperative tense, so this is a command, Paul Paul isn't asking us to do this, Paul is telling us to do this, and he tells us to do it twice. I think we get a hint of the answer in Paul's relationship with the Philippian church itself. He loves this church. He loves these people. The Philippians, perhaps more than any other church in the first century, any other group of people, were instrumental. They were a huge part of Paul's missionary journeys. They were a huge part of his own personal joy. The thought of the Philippians filled him with gladness, as if he were sitting at a feast rather than sitting in a jail cell, because that's where he was when he wrote this letter. Every time Paul thinks about them, Paul is filled with joy. He loves them. And so he tells them to rejoice. He tells them to have the same joy that he does whenever he thinks about them. That's why he tells them to rejoice twice. I think he also tells them to rejoice twice because of how difficult it is to have continual joy in this life kind of like what we talked about earlier if you if you've lived for just a little bit of time on this earth you realize that having joy always rejoicing in all circumstances is not easy to do and Paul of all people would know the difficulties of maintaining a spirit of joy through life's hardships he's been through all kinds of tough stuff right he's been shipwrecked he's been beat up and whipped a number of times he's been betrayed by friends falsely accused and mistrusted often He's in prison on multiple occasions, just like when he's writing this letter. I mean, think about that for two shakes. He's in prison, and he's telling people to have joy, to rejoice always, right? Um, here's, Here's what Paul's getting at. Here's what I think Paul is getting at. Having joy is a practice. It's something you need to work at, something you must work at, like building muscles, You don't just try really hard and hope a whole bunch and pray that God would give you more muscles. Rather, you find some weights. You get in the gym. You go for a run. Maybe you even hire a personal trainer, and then you start sweating. You work at it. That's how you develop muscles. The same is true for joy. Paul found himself in situations where having joy was difficult. He had to develop the habit of maintaining joy even when his circumstances dictated that he despair. So he loves the Philippian Christians. I think that's why he tells them to rejoice twice. And he realizes that rejoicing always is really difficult. And so he tells them twice, do it anyway, work at it, practice having joy. And then he tells them twice to rejoice because of how important it is in the Christian life. Maybe, maybe more than, than if you were outside the church. I, I really do believe a joyous God desires a joyous people. We are to rejoice always because that's how God approaches us with rejoicing. Guys, guys, don't miss this, church, right? Like, how easy is it to forget that God, the God that we love, the God that we serve, He loves us. He's compassionate towards us. He has great joy when he thinks about us. 
I think sometimes when we think about God, we think that he might be angry with us. We think that he might be displeased with us, that certainly he disapproves of some of our actions, some of our thoughts and behaviors, that his justice and his righteousness are, are just so beyond us, right? That, that we're fallen, broken humans, that there's no way we can live up to his standards, that, that we can meet his holiness. And all of that is true. He is just. He is righteous. He is holy without compare, right? Beyond comparison, his holiness is so unlike us. Yet he wants so badly to be with us. He wants so badly to commune with us, to welcome us into his fellowship, right? We need look no further than Jesus and the cross for proof of this. What it, listen, what is the gospel anyway? It's glad tidings of great joy, is it not? Right, you remember when the, when the angels came to the shepherds right outside of Bethlehem and they were tending their sheep and they said, don't be afraid. We bring you glad tidings of great joy and this will be for all the world, right? That you would live. This is God with us. This is God making himself known by sending his son into the world to assume our flesh and blood and then to die our death on the cross. This is good news of great joy. Paul says you should rejoice always. I'll say it again, rejoice, because this is crucial to what it means to believe in Jesus. It's foundational to what it means to be a Christian. It's the gospel, so we're called to rejoice. Then Paul switches gears a little bit. He uses a watch word for early Christians there at the end of verse 5. He says, the Lord is at hand. This is key. When the Philippians read that phrase, their ears would have perked up. They would have been reminded again of why they have joy, and where they place their joy. See, for the early Christians, as it should be for us, the return of Christ was a guarantee. They were so sure of his return, and not just of his return, but of his immediate return. Jesus coming back was imminent. Just a little while longer, they would say, and Jesus will come back. If we can just wait a bit more, we'll see him again. We just need to hang on because whatever we're facing, whatever injustice, whatever trial, whatever difficulty is going on right now in our lives, it'll be over soon because Jesus is coming back. Jesus will return. They believed this so strongly. The Lord is at hand, says Paul. This belief allowed those Christians not only to rejoice, which is what Paul just told them to do, but it also believed that uh, it, it also helped them. It enabled the early Christians to not be anxious. So the first command is rejoice. The second command is don't be anxious. Again, Paul's not asking us to do this. Paul's telling us not to be anxious. So picture the phrase "the Lord is at hand" as a hinge on a really big door. And as this hinge swings the door one way, you see scribbled on this side of the door, rejoice always. And then the hinge, the Lord is at hand, the hinge swings the door the other way, and you see scribbled on this side of the door, don't be anxious. Pray about everything, right? This hinge is crucial in the text, and the hinge is crucial for us. The Lord is at hand. I wonder, church, I wonder if there's something in that for us today. Not that I'm claiming to have prophecy, not that I'm claiming to know the end times or whatever, but I wonder if this phrase, the Lord is at hand, was so important for Christians 2,000 years ago. I wonder how it can be important for us today. What does that mean in our context today? And if that's true, can we rejoice always? And can we not have anxiety? Can we not be anxious for anything? Which brings us to verses 6 and 7. Paul tells his friends not to be anxious, to instead pray with thankful hearts about everything. This is a great and popular verse, right? It's sometimes used to comfort people who worry about things. You know the type. 
We call them worry warts. We tell them to calm down. We call them to take a chill pill, not to worry as much, as if worrying as much was something that they could control completely. And yes, perhaps worry or the attitude and the posture of worry is something that we can at least monitor, something we can maybe change like we, like we change the temperature in the room by going to a thermostat and hitting a few buttons. But I also wonder if what Paul is encouraging the Philippians with goes a bit deeper than that. That, that it's more than just pushing a few buttons in our heart or pushing a few buttons in our mind and now our anxiety ratchets down. Because I think anxiety and worry and fear can sometimes be a whole lot bigger than the pet names we give them. Anxiety and fear can be a whole lot more serious than just getting over it, than just figuring out a way to move on and, and move on. I think Paul knows this. I think God knows this. And yet right here in Scripture, we have this admonition not to be anxious about anything. So what does Paul mean by this? I think he means a couple things. First, the command should not be taken as a call to perfection. Spiritual freedom, real joy for most of us, won't put an end to all the worldly anxiety. Spiritual freedom, real joy, I think instead can put worldly anxiety in its place where it can be easily handled. Right? See, this isn't the ceasing of anxiety, and it's certainly not the dismissal of past anxiety or worry or fear. Paul isn't telling us to get rid of all of that and to pretend like it doesn't exist. What he's saying is that through prayers, through rejoicing, God wants to do a work of redemption in your anxiety, concerning your anxiety. God doesn't want us to forget our worries. He wants to redeem our worries. Those anxieties, those fears, those issues all make you who you are in this very moment. To forget them or to deny them or to pretend they never existed would be to rob God of the opportunity to redeem all of that mess. He's not saying forget your anxieties. He's not saying get over your fears and your insecurities. God is in the redemption business. This is what he loves to do, and it's something that only he can do, right? He can take the worst of situations, the most difficult circumstances, and turn them into something beautiful. Right, this, this last week, I, I can't help but think of a couple families right now. The one, obviously, is the Krogman family, right? When I think about Trevor and his family, right, and the stuff that they're up against, right, it would be a poor use of this text to say that Paul wants them to stop worrying and to pray their anxiety away and to just have joy because that's what God wants us to do. That's not what the text is saying. What the text does offer the Krogmans, as well as all of us, is that the comfort that we can take, it's, it's comfort that we can take all of our anxiety, all of our pain, all of our loss, or what have you, and we can give it to God. Cast all your cares on Him because He cares for you, right? That's, that's how the Apostle Peter puts it when he writes a letter to early Christians. Right smack in the middle of the hard. That's where we find joy. That's where we can experience peace because our God is a God who redeems all the hard. He's a God who makes beautiful all the messy stuff. So we take all of our stuff to God. We put God in first place and we put all that other stuff in second place and then we experience peace, right? There's this, uh, this other family I, I mentioned that they're personal friends of ours from a church that we served in Texas. Their names are Chad and Christy. Uh, their, their almost 15-year-old son died on Tuesday this week. And I'm planning this sermon, and I'm reading through Philippians, and it's like, boy, there's joy everywhere, right? Like, I'm supposed to rejoice, and I'm not supposed to be anxious, and it's like, good golly, what do I say to the couples? How do I, how do I respond to that, right? It's not forget. It's not get over it. It's just, just give this to God. And when we do that, when the Krogmans can do that, when the Copels can do that, we experience peace, which Paul gets at a little later. So the first thing is, don't, don't think that 
not being anxious is God saying, try to be perfect. Just forget all that stuff and get better. The second meaning Paul wants us to make to not be anxious is that is the way in which we're not anxious. He says that we should pray with thanksgiving, that we should ask God for what we really want. The focus here for Paul is completely on the positive. He says, pray with thanksgiving. We can't ask God for new mercies unless we're mindful of the mercies he's already given us. The unthankful person can't pray because they have no sense of the goodness of God. Give thanks to God in all circumstances. That's how Paul says it in his letter to the Thessalonians, right? Now he's saying it again. Pray with thanksgiving about everything. We thank God, and then we give him our wish list. Paul's focus is on the positive, those things which God has already done for us, and those things which we believe by faith God will do for us. These are the things that we pray about. So the medicine for anxiety and worry is rejoicing and prayer. As he closes the letter, Paul encourages the Philippians to rejoice regardless of circumstance and to pray about everything with joy. Again, practicing these two things, making them a habit, is the only surefire way to keep anxiety and fear and the unknown in their place. We don't ignore those things because life is full of them. We need to be responsible, right? We need to think about our past. We need to think about our present. We need to think how we're going to respond in gracious ways in the future. But rejoicing and praying with thanksgiving reminds us of God's sovereignty. It reminds us of how much he's already done for us to ensure that we'll get to be in heaven and that we'll get to have peace on earth until we get to heaven. May I encourage you, if you're struggling with worry, with fear, with anxiety this morning, would you count your blessings? Would you talk to God about everything and would you watch how God blesses your vulnerability with his peace the God of peace or the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus the final note of encouragement in these verses are 8 and 9 Paul says that whatever is true and honorable and just and pure and lovely commendable excellent worthy of praise these things should be thought about and it's not the kind of thinking that is similar to daydreaming or or like when you're not really thinking of anything and and then something pops into your mind like the word paul uses here is a word that has the idea of calculating with it he says if there's anything that's worthy and excellent and true and right and honorable and noble think or calculate about these things picture a carpenter who's building some cabinets for his home he measures and then, and then he thinks a little bit about it, and then he measures again, right? Measure twice, cut once. And then he goes and he looks at the location where the cabinets are going to be, and he comes back and he measures again, right? He calculates how the cabinets are going to fit into the room and into the house. This is the kind of thinking that we're to do on everything that's right and true and honorable and excellent, And while you're calculating those things, says Paul, Paul says, don't forget to think about me. Look at my example, right? Paul Paul is a pretty humble guy. If there's a little bit of hubris in him, you'll find it right here in uh, in verses 8 and 9, verse 9, right? Whatever you've learned from me, whatever you've heard from me, spend time thinking about those things. Spend time practicing those things because Paul's goal is, is really just to be like Christ, So if he's telling the Philippians to rejoice always, if he's telling the Philippians not to worry, to pray about everything with thanksgiving, if he's telling the Philippians to do all these things, he's really just saying, try to be like me because I'm trying to be like Jesus, right? It's not not so much a self-seeking thing, but he knows that if if they try to be like him, then they'll be doing all right because he's trying to be like Jesus. So we rejoice always. We pray with thanksgiving And all of this is to be done with joy. Trinity Church, would this be our posture regardless of circumstance? Can this be how we are regardless of your past? 
regardless of whatever is going on in your life right now, would you rejoice in the Lord? Would you pray about everything? And would you do that with great joy? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.